have heard today a lot of, about uh, scientific content uh, in the media. A lot of uh, great experts uh, talk about topics covered in uh, media and how to do it well. So now we will proceed to some other great examples of bringing science uh, to the public. Uh, bringing space um, to the public is the title of the address by Marusha Strach, the executive director of the World Space Week Association based in Vienna, Austria. Uh, Marusha Strach, um, welcome and uh, please uh, tell us uh, more about space. Thank you so much, uh, Maya, for this kind introduction. Let me share my screen. So first, dear distinguished uh, guests, panelists, organizers, thank you for this very kind introduction uh, to, this, to this festival. It is an, a great honor and also privilege for me to, to speak to you today. And the common thread of today's panel is going to be popularization of space and how we communicate science. As the executive director of the World Space Week Association, an organization that is focused on outreach, this is truly a pleasure for me and uh, I'm very glad to be, to be with you here today. Let me start at the beginning. Why do we do what we do? We know that global space activities are booming. Since 1962, the UN is maintaining a register of objects launched into outer space. And on January 1st, 2020, we had over 6,500 satellites in orbit. Out of those, over 3,000 were active. This, this shows that there is a great interest and great need for space technologies and space applications. And our goal is to bring space closer to society, to strengthen the link between space and society, to do this through public education, participation and dialogue, and bring more attention to these activities and really show how they benefit humanity as a whole. We do this by using World Space Week, a UN declared event as a focus and as a platform for, share of idea, for sharing of ideas, for conversations, for participants of World Space Week to really come together and to talk about space and organize events that showcase how important space technologies are for everyone. Who are we? We are a nonprofit, non-government organization that was founded in 1981. And, and we are supporting the UN in the global coordination of World Space Week. We are also permanent observers to the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And we are a member of the International Astronautical Federation. World Space Week was declared by the UN General Assembly to be held annually in 1999. And the dates of World Space Week have been unchanged since then, 4 to 10 of October. These dates are not coincidental. October 4th was the launch of Sputnik, the first man-made satellite. And October 10th was the day the Outer Space Treaty came into force. When I talk about international celebration of space, what do I mean? I would like to bring your attention to the graph on, on your screens. Um, you can see the growth of events in, in over World Space Week. In 2012, we, all, we had around 1,000. In 2019, we reached our record number over 8,000 events. And then during uh, the current situation, this number dropped a bit, um, but we are very confident it's going to be larger and bigger in, in the following years to come. And this World Space Week events are organized by the industry, by space agencies, by schools, by planetaria, by museums, individuals, and many others. We, however, do a lot before these events even take place. Every year, our board of directors selects a team that will be the focus of World Space Week. In 2021, that theme was women in space. We were focused on SDG 5, on gender equality, and we celebrated accomplishments of women by raising awareness, uh, contributing to solutions, and also inspiring young women around the world to pursue STEM studies and future careers in the space industry. 
one of the major goals was to showcase role models. We really cannot underestimate the importance of seeing people who look like you and come from the same backgrounds as you in leadership roles, in leadership positions. If we showcase women and their accomplishments to young women, to girls, then we raise another generation of empowered women who will continue these great achievements of humanity when it comes to space technologies and be empowered to actually reach out and, and participate in, in STEM studies. Today's panel on popularization and communication of science is all female panel. That was not a coincidence. Um, we wanted to really show how much women contribute to the sector and everything that is really going on when it comes to women and how important it is to see faces that look like yours. But we cannot do it alone. And we had extraordinary help from our honorary chair 2021, Miss Lisa Callahan, who is the VP of Lockheed Martin and general manager of commercial civil space. She and Lockheed Martin have been an incredible support and truly helped us build around the theme of women in space and make sure that we can reach as many girls as possible and further our programs and make sure that we really showcase the accomplishments and celebrations of women all around the globe. How do we do what we do? This year, we started a very exciting series of webinars and a podcast that was focused on celebrating the accomplishments of women, but also touched upon the obstacles, the hurdles that women are facing and what is necessary to overcome them. We also collaborated with several partner organizations and worked with them on raising the profiles of women. The desired outcomes were three. We asked ourselves three questions before we started um, promoting this team. The first was, what are the hurdles that women and girls are facing when they're getting into the sector, in the space sector? Are there unique challenges to women and girls in the space sector? And then at the end, how can we support women and girls to enter the space sector? And what do we need to do to retain them? It's not enough that women start STEM studies. It's not enough that women enter space sector. We also have to keep them here and we need to empower women so they can reach leadership positions as well. Why does this matter? With conversations like this, we are raising public awareness and we are also raising public interest. And the power that comes with public awareness and interest should never be underestimated because it can affect political will, it affects change, it affects positive change and sheds a light on importance of space activities. Once we achieve that, we have greater support of people that will be next leaders and affect this, this before mentioned um, positive change. On, on this screen, I have four out of 17 uh, space development goal, uh, sustainable development goals, because one thing that our organization wanted to do was to identify which are the four SDGs that we contribute to most. And we settled on quality education, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure and partnership for the goals. This matters because we, we help building for workforce of tomorrow by inspiring students. We are educating the public about the benefits of space. We also help promote organizations that are involved in space and we demonstrate the public support for space activities. So misunderstandings about space, misunderstandings about entering the space sector are often challenging for a lot of people who would otherwise be empowered and would be wanting to enter the sector. And consequently, events like World Space Week helps them reach out and be involved. With this, I would like to conclude my, my presentation um, and uh, give the word to a dear friend, a dear colleague, and an incredible space lady, 
Shimrit Maman, who is going to, to moderate the panel that we're going to start right now. And um, before, before I give the floor to her, let me quote what she said, that although, although it is a vast icy void, space holds unique opportunities for dreamers unafraid to boldly face meaningful challenges. And this sums up everything that we can say about today's panel, about empowerment of women, about communication of science and how important it is that we really stand together in this and try to make it as popular as we possibly can. Please, Shimrit, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's so good to see our panelists here. And thank you, Mauricio, for this really, really interesting introduction and overview of the World Space Week activity. We are so, so proud to take part of this activity as well here in Israel and all over Europe. With us today are three very special panelists. We have Mary Wellesley from Elvas, and we have Thea Dubnik from the World Space Week organization, and a personal friend and colleague, Gina Halaby from She Speaks Science from the University of Cambridge. Thank you all for joining us today. This webinar is going to bring together different space professionals who have been communicating and popular, popularizing science coming from different parts of Europe, from both the private and public sector, as well as the uh, NGO of World Space Week. We are trying to create a diverse panel and provide our audience with great examples and initiatives taken up by our speakers. So I would like to first ask Mary, to kindly introduce yourself, uh, discuss a bit what you do, and allow us to know your world a bit better. Well, thanks very much, Shimrit. Um, it's really, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, I, I've been working in the space sector for about uh, 20 years, um, and I don't have a scientific background, but I have been, I've completely fallen in love with the world um, because uh, there's so many exciting things that do, that happen in space. And it's really the backbone of our daily lives. Uh, and, and I've just been totally drawn in and I love the opportunity of the communicator to be telling the stories that make people go wow and really make people understand the importance of space in everything we do because I don't think people realize just how much space is behind our, day, our daily lives. I mean, we, we've, we've estimated that we probably use satellites about 40 times every day, whether it's from, you know, using our, our sat navs or, you know, it's behind banking transactions, it's behind the electricity grid, uh, it, it, it connects, uh, you know, connects people, there's weather satellites, it, you know, it, it enables international news. There's so much it does. And, and I just don't think people have, uh, you know, any, you know, there's not a wide enough understanding of just how much uh, space space does. Um, and it's also, a, it's also a very, um, it's a unique community. It's, it's, you know, a relatively small industry, the space industry compared to, compared to others in the world. And, and it's like, there's a real sort of family feel to it. And that's very exciting too. Well, thank you so much. But having said that, and it is a small community, and I see Gina all around, and I find I hug Marushka every time I have a chance to. But still, if we open it up to the general public, and and learning from your experience in Airbus, how does Airbus communicate its involvement with science to the general public? I think what's key is making it relevant and meaningful to people having this link to their daily lives and then you can go in and wow them with science behind it um you know it, it's you can just say to people well satellites communicate they navigate but if you say uh imagine you're staying in the countryside and you haven't got netflix anymore <laughs> that's when it when it starts being it be being meaningful meaningful and then you and then you can also tell people that did you know that you know, when you ate your breakfast cereal this morning, uh, that was thanks to partly thanks to satellites. And they say, well, how's that? 
and you and you then explain that track that, that farmers these these days have connected cabins in their tractors and it's satellites that monitor the field and tell people tell the farmers how much water they need to use so it's it, it's better for the planet but they only use the amount of required amount of water and also just how much fertilizer they need which is also something that we you know the world is keen to reduce and I think it's when you tell stories like this that people go, ah, <laughs> and it's the, the wow, the, the aha moment. Yeah, and then they realize how it is in our everyday life. Yeah, exactly. I, I completely agree. Thank you so much, Mary. Gina, how are you? <laughs> Hello, how are you? Good to see everyone. Hello to the fellow panelists. It's wonderful to meet you today. And hi to everyone who, uh, who, who has dialed in to listen to us. Yeah, Gina, I would love for you to introduce yourself. We do know you're from Cambridge, but if you could provide us with a little more background and elaborate of your role on the She Space, uh, of the She Speaks, sorry, on the She Speaks Science and tell us more about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist by background. Um, I was born in Lebanon. Now I work at Cambridge University and I currently wear different hats. So my work right now is to help scientists commercialize their research. So bringing that impact from the scientific labs and research groups to the hands of those who need it. Um, as you mentioned, Shimrit, I'm also the, the founder of She Speaks Science. And in short, She Speaks Science is a social enterprise that aims to do two things. Number one is to promote and celebrate the women in STEM. And number two is to promote STEM for both young girls and boys and we do this through storytelling and through mentorship um, we have two main activities one is storytelling so we publish stories uh, online from storytellers around the globe and these are women in stem doing impactful research so we tend to tell about how impactful the research is the work they're doing and how it benefits us in our daily life and this also uh, this is a crucial aspect to so to show the impact of science on society young people need to see and to hear more stories of women who work in science and who have gone to uh, achieve great things uh, for humanity the second thing is mentorship through our mentorship program called penta which is a global network of young uh, women and girls in different career stages from uh, school up to executive level. Uh, the past cohort we've had, uh, 24 countries were represented from Mexico to Malaysia. And each one on this cohort mentors um, the one underneath her on the career ladder and gets mentored by the one above her. And this is to promote the idea of taking and giving back, to promote the idea of community, a tightly knit community, and also to give a sense of agency, the idea that whoever you are, someone is looking up to you, someone wants to be, hopes to be like you one day. And now we're expanding into more uh, immersive storytelling and immersive, and immersive narrative through um, AR, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality settings. And this is work in progress. So starting to think of creative and futuristic ways to engage the young people in, in, in space and in the role of, uh, of the important role of women in space exploration. That's amazing. <laughs> that is just absolutely amazing. And we we recently published an article about that role of mentorship. Uh, we have a similar program called She Space. That's what that was my confusion before. Uh, we we all do similar things, uh, and it's so blessed and uh, as much more activities as that we could have in order to promote the girls and women and get them more engaged with science. So that's amazing. And uh, I, I don't think you mentioned it, so I'm going to mention it in a, in a bit. 
but you have over five languages of your program. Everything is available on five different languages, which is absolutely fantastic. That's right. The stories are available in English, Spanish, uh, Arabic, Italian, and, uh, and uh, German. Well, that's so, and that's so important, especially uh, Marushka was mentioning that before, in order to enhance the locability and the general, um, um, uh, how, oh, I'm missing the word, <laughs> the national identity of these children, seeing people who are like you and giving them a sense of what they could become. So I'm very proud of that as well. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Thea. Please introduce yourself, and then I would love to ask you some questions as well. Thank you for the word, Timrit. Um, hello, everyone. I am Thea. I am World Space Week Association's Operations Manager and a person behind our social media campaign, as well as the logistics of our um, online webinar series. So um, I am currently a Master of Arts candidate at the University of Groningen. Uh, where I am writing my master's thesis on the territorialization of outer space. So whether this is possible or not, and how do um, space resources tie into this whole story. Uh, but besides that, I'm also volunteering for International Institute of Space Law's Knowledge Constellation, which is um, a project where we try to bring space law closer to the people. So I have some experience with communicating um, content to, to individuals who are interested in various different topics. Uh, but then I'm also the UNUSA Space for Women mentee. So I also know the other side of the specter of the mentorship two-way uh, relationship. So um, through that, I was also able to see how important it is to have a role model, how important it is to have someone who opens the doors for you and it's up to you which doors you choose. So um, that's how I also got to know Marushka, for example, um, and um, became involved with the space sector a bit more. That's amazing. And so great to see it happening. So could you just tell us a bit more about uh, how do you, with your hat in the World Space Week or Association, how do you popular, popularize uh, science during the entire year? Uh, this year in particular was Women in Space. We know that next year's theme is going to be uh, space and sustainability. Could you just tell us more about the, the association, a few more words and about the actions at itself? So um, how we do it is basically we firstly um, determine what would be the best content related to our, our overarching theme. So this year, because the theme was Women in Space, we've decided to explore um, about wh which women were the ones who shaped the history of the space sector and how they did it, what kind of uh, hurdles they had in front of them and how they overcame them. Um, we wanted to show these women as role models to and, and really show to people that no matter where you come from, whether you are being discriminated on your basis of the gender or, or, or the race or or whatever it may be, you can still be someone who, who shapes the history of a particular sector or, or, or market or, or just a part of the world. Um, so we decided to um, highlight these women on, and celebrate them on the days of their, of their birthdays. Um, and we just uh, put forward their short biographies where we really try to emphasize not only what they achieved, but as I said, what kind of an environment they really grew up in. Um, who were the people who lifted them up? Who were the ones who maybe said, no, science is not for you. Mm, you know, um, engineering is not for girls and, and how they reacted to that. And, and that was really inspiring. And I think that people who maybe see themselves um, in, in such cases, in, in, in similar roles, um, could really see something um, interesting and, and, and become empowered through that. Um, so that was our main goal. We, of course, tried to make them uh, look as aesthetic as possible, to make them short enough so that you can really read them fast enough, because that's what social media is about. It's not about long reads, but it's about something that is interesting, that catches your eye, and that, you know, you can digest very quickly. Um, so for the next year, uh, when the topic, as you said, is going to be um, sustainability uh, and space, 
um, we are planning to do um, a similar campaign, uh, but we're going to focus on the connection between SDGs and uh, the SDG targets with space. So with that, we are aiming to show people how space is really everywhere, how, how our every day is impacted by the technology that we use, how our quality of life um, can be made better with the use of, of space technologies um, and how we can really reach the, the sustainable um, use of environment, of resources, and just like sustainable development um, in our lives uh, with the use of space technologies and space in general. So that's going to be, um, that's coming on our social media uh, accounts soon. Well, we definitely know that social media has a really great effect on everything that is connected to, to science. And uh, I think most scientists do not realize that yet. There is this generation gap that we still have to overcome. Uh, sometimes even myself that I don't feel that old, uh, but I, I do feel like a dinosaur when I start using social media. <laughs> well, that is why we need non-scientists to help us bridge the, bridge the, the gap. Thank you. Great, Mary, I'm gonna go back to you and ask you about your activities during World Space Week uh, in Airbus. Well, you did say how bringing everyday life to the people does excite them, but did you feel any difference with your activities during the World Space Week or do you have any ongoing activities to the public and engagement during the whole year? How does it work with Airbus? Well, yeah, Airbus has its own uh, outreach program, the Airbus Foundation, uh, and there are a lot of efforts to, uh, we've done a whole series of animations to try and try and explain, you know, right across everything that Airbus does, uh, you know, all our aerospace activities. Uh, we did a special spirit series on the moon a few years ago. Um, so, you know, we do, and we have uh, extensive outreach uh, in each of our four home nations, as we call them, in, in, in the UK and France, Germany and Spain. Um, so that does happen all, all year round, but um, I think it's great to have World Space Week as this sort of focus point for the whole industry to, to get everyone, you know, uh, you know, really, you know, well, when you don't have a fixed rendezvous point, then I don't, you, 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 you can always say, oh, no, I'm too busy right now. But I think it, 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 we really see it with our employees. We literally have hundreds of employees who go out and speak to, to, um, uh, to school children right across Europe and even even beyond Europe, we had we had one employee not even working in the space side of the business, and she went out to the states for a year on a on a sabbatical uh, when when her husband was was seconded out there, and, and she contacted us because she knew that we make a lot of resources available to our employees. We created a whole series of of presentations, and and she said, look, I want to go into this class in, in the states and tell them tell them about space and you know that's that's something something really special um and and so um you know it, i suppose it, it's just i think i think also what's what's great is that the uh, the employees really I, when you have your own children it sort of also really brings it home and we see how how our employees love going to speak to their own children's classes and I remember when my children were really little, I thought, well, how can I go in and talk about space to, to like six year olds or, you know, even even younger? They can't, yeah, how old were they? Must have been about five, the first the first year group I did. And I actually sat down with a friend of mine who's, who's an actress. And I and, and she said and we sort of brainstormed how we could go about this. And we, and we came up with this really fun story of, you know, of a rover going to Mars, but we gave them names and, and, and made it accessible for five-year-olds. And we actually now have turned that into a presentation that all our employees can use when they go to this sort of the very, very youngest age. And that's, you know, that's an age old trick. We, we always use stories uh, to, 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 to make, help younger children understand how the world works. Um, and so we have different sort of, uh, assets for different levels, uh, you know, levels of, of school years. And it just makes it, that we see makes it easier for all our employees, even if they don't work in space, to, to, to pick up the presentation that, you know, makes sense to them. And equally, we've started making presentations specific to the theme of the year. So we had, of course, a women in space 
presentation this year. Um, uh, and so I think that's, uh, and we also put fun things there. We have quizzes, we've got satellite models to make, uh, and that again makes it so much easier for kids to you know, get their hands on this satellite model and uh, you know and then they can start asking questions about how it works we can start discussing that's amazing it, it it gives such a great sense of community not just for your employees but for everybody around it gets everybody so engaged so that's really great to hear that Thank yeah you. and I, I think i think it's great for the for our employees to see that airbus wants to support that um, because it's basically giving them a platform to 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 talk about what they do, and and it, and it's quite a proud moment when your kids uh, want you to keep coming back into their classroom and say, "Hey, my mum works in space." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it is. Uh, going back to Gina, and we have a sense of uh, we have to fight a lot of things, and it is 2021, and we see that still women are too few in the space community. And we have these great programs coming along. We're both on the Space for Women Network and mentorship program. And still looking around, we just realize women are too few and we are trying to overcome that. And if we take a, a look where we're losing the women along the way, there are several there are several leaky pipelines that we identified, but usually at the age of 12, we know that we have a really critical point and we're losing some interest. So how do organizations like She Speaks Science spark that enthusiasm for science in children, especially for young girls at that very problematic age? How do we battle this trend? Mm. Um, that's that's a really important and, and difficult question. The approach we use as She Speaks Science is storytelling. And we believe this is a powerful approach for three reasons. Reason number one is that stories, as Mary mentioned, they're agents to spark the imagination and motivate young people and young women and girls to explore science. We're all interested in stories. Stories grab us, they hook us. Especially once you have characters in there. Mary, you said you give them names. You know, it's such a simple yet powerful and profound technique. If there's a change, there's progress, there's an adventure in that story, sense of adventure. Girlhood, girlhood is is changing being a girl being 11 or 12 years old these days is different from what it used to be these days girls are individualistic they are activists they have a message and if you listen to them they want to explore different things and they want to make impact they want to change the world they really really want to change the world and through science through showing the impact of science on everyday lives we can, we can, they can do that. And we show them that science can do that. Number two is stories normalize failure. And this is a very important concept. One factor that deters young people from engaging in science or pursuing a scientific career or a STEM career in general is the idea that scientists, a scientist is a genius. Their ideas, you know, fall from the sky somehow. Um, our stereotypical role models seem to have enforced a certain normative idea of who does STEM. And these, you know, role models or stories that we've heard before tend to overlook struggle and resilience as a crucial part of doing science. So Taya mentioned, you mentioned the hurdles uh, of getting there. And so by narrating the struggle of a scientist as a protagonist who is looking for the truth, who's searching for the truth, is, is really effective in, in normalizing failure, in building resilience among these young explorers. And it also, um, it emphasizes the importance of being resilient when you do science. You fail, you fail, you fail, you fail again, and then you succeed. It's not like an easy, very straightforward path. 
The third and final reason uh, we believe stories are, are helpful is that they normalize the idea of, of, of a woman scientist. Um, you know, like the idea of, of a scientist being a, a straight, middle-aged white man is so entrenched in us simply because of all the stories we've been exposed to, all the scientist stories in our ancient libraries. They emphasize and, you know, um, reinforce this idea. And so by seeing more and more women brought to the spotlight, um, these young boys and young men as well, they come to realize and come to view this as a normal um, thing rather than an exception. And this helps bring about a certain uh, a change in culture, which is also very important. Thank you so much for all. They are going back to social media and understanding its critical role. And Gina was explaining how every little girl has a message these days and she could use social media as a platform. And we look up to Greta Thunberg, for example, fighting climate change for all of us all together. And, and I'm sure we're gonna hear about her during the next Space Week, uh, even though she doesn't, um, she doesn't directly target space, but she does target SDG 13 and will bring that all together. But, Using the social, the social media platforms and all of your activity as uh, on World Space Week activity, do you tell us about what you learned from the feedback of the audience? What did they like most? What worked best for them? How, how could we learn from your experience and communicate science better to everyone? So if I just tell you an example, one of the posts that had the biggest outreach was a post by Catherine Sullivan. She was one of our notable women um, and it was shared, liked and commented on the most. So um, we, we described what she did, we described her um, in incredible achievements. Uh, but as I said, social media posts and social media content needs to be short but interesting enough. This is no place to ramble all about the achievements that should be highlighted and everything interesting in the lives of these people, but rather to really highlight and, and show people the things that they can relate to, um, the, the things that they can see themselves in. So um, in the case of Notable Women, as I said, it was about telling, you know, they didn't have support of their, their families or, or they had the support of their families or they were told because you're a woman, you cannot be an astronomer. And they overcame that. So that was really important because what we were told by our followers was that this is something that they were searching for. This is something that, you know, was interesting for them. They could, they could really find themselves in, in role models like this. So um, what I would advise people who want to communicate science is find this relatability, whatever it is with the content that you're producing, whatever is the theme, find something that people can relate to. Do not be too long, do not be too um, uh, scientific if you want, do not, do not include too much statistics, be a storyteller and, and make it relatable for people. Besides that, of course, make it aesthetic so that it looks looks nice as well, uh, because that increases clickability. But um, mostly, this relatability, this this personal approach that people can actually uh, tell apart um, our posts from you know posts from another similar project that also aims to uh, bring forward the issues of gender inequality. Thank you. Okay, I could ask you another question without naming a specific social network or, or referring to one. Uh, do, you, do you think that pictures and, and visualizing things works better than text based on your experience, of course? Mm -hmm. You know, the first thing, like, the first thing that you see on a post is the visual. So before you actually click on, on the text or, or go and read the text that is above it or, or next to it, you will see that picture. So that's why, for example, the notable women posts always include a photo of the woman so that you already kind of get to know her, um, their names and some of their most important achievements. Um, so that you already from that visual, you can, you can tell what this is all about. 
And then you can go further and read more into the details about the, the achievements, the, the, the progress that this person went through uh, throughout their, their life. So I would say that looking from my personal view and as well as from just the statistics, the analytics that we, uh, we um, were able to uh, take away from our social media campaign, it's mostly the pictures that people like. So it's not just when we included the link, for example, read more about it, the clicks were not really that high, but the impressions, the outreach, the engagement from the, from the, the visual aspect was way higher. So uh, definitely invest into that if you're looking to, to popularize science through, through social media. Yeah, we're actually as scientists, and I think that uh, you know can back me up here. We are seeing this trend even in the articles we are now writing. It's not just about being very uh, concrete in the abstract. We also have the highlights of the article, and we're also are now asked to put in a graphical abstract, which just summarizes every major result in the article, the most important thing, but in a graphical manner. So yeah, I think that that has a really great uh, impact nowadays with the, especially with social media. That's amazing. Uh, it's, it's just so nice to see how everything is progressing <laughs> and, and, and getting easier and simpler. So Mary, going back to you. And of course, if you have any questions you wanna ask each other, I would love for you to to feel free, okay? I'm just here as a moderator role, but you could interact as well and, and, and have your inputs as much as you wish. Uh, we did understand how Airbus is engaged within its own community and the and employees. Um, how do you encourage your employees, uh, apart from just having them provided with uh, with the presentation, which is great. I, I would personally love to get my hands on some of those presentations. I could already tell you. <laughs> uh, but how do you they're get on them? the World's Facebook website. <laughs> okay, great, perfect. I think our audience would want to know that. It's just <laughs> amazing because we, we usually have uh, astronauts over for uh, different events and highlight them. And, and you know, so astronauts are really limited at the end. Right, there's like 600 astronauts overall. There's not that many people who left Earth. And we have so many other people that are engaged in space activities, uh, in law, in astrophysics, in other different topics. So how do you get your employees to be more involved in their community and communicate what you do apart from just providing them with these uh, presentations? Do you have any other activities that you get them more engaged or even in-house within Airbus. How do you work on that then? Um, I think we, we try to give, give examples of what other people have done. And certainly we, we organized recently together with World Space Week, we organized the, the Airbus Guide to World Space Week where we actually uh, presented a selection of employees who, who'd gone out and done perhaps more unusual things than than simply going into a classroom. Now, already going into the classroom can be a big step, particularly if you don't have a scientific background. Uh, and, and I think it actually brings the whole of the company together. I think sometimes in, in, in a scientific or technical domain, there's perhaps a, an almost a divide between those who are technical and non-technical. But I think because they, we, we make these resources available and we show that people from all disciplines within the company, in finance, in procurement, in comms, in, in HR, as well as all our engineers are, are happily going out and, and using these resources. I think that really helps and it gives people confidence that, oh, oh yeah, maybe I could do that too. Uh, I mean, one of the examples we had recently was a, a team in, in Seville. We actually don't have an Airbus space site in Seville. But they got so excited about, about, about World Space Week and, and wanting to share uh, everything that space does that they worked with the town, with a city hall to set up an event right in the center of Seville. And they've been doing this for years now. And this, this is all organized entirely by, by the employees. They get together, they work out what, what activities they're going to, to, to introduce each year. They built a huge rocket using recyclable material one year. They had their um, the solar system race where they 
they made balls of different sizes looking like each of the planets and then they had they asked the kids questions on you know and they had to run to the relevant planet and and i think it's when the more ideas you give people the the, the you know not everything will appeal to everyone but you share a range of ideas and then then you know maybe one person will go oh yeah i could do that um so i think that was and I mean, one of our employees is so so impressive. He built his own Mars rover because Airbus actually makes a, a rover that's going to be launched to Mars next year. Um, and uh, we have our own Mars yard in Stevenage where we have brought a lot of skilled school children to come and come and see the rover in action as it you know practices in our Mars yard. But one of our employees actually made his very own Mars rover, and he takes this Mars rover around to to schools and. He gets the kids to drive it and then they ask all kinds of questions and you know he can talk about how the wheels of our actual rover can can go over rocks that are 30 centimeters high and it uses you know its own navigation to do this because it couldn't wait for instructions from from earth because of the huge time delay that that would that would cause and and it just brings things home to people that, that's amazing. It is. It is. It gives such a sense of diversity and all the different aspects of their art of space. And, and well, currently we don't have people going to Mars. I, I think we're going to see them. I hope we're going to see them soon. But those rovers are really <laughs> are cool and they do the job. Yeah. And I, I was really, really interested in the point that Gina made about um, failure. And actually, we have, we've uh, run workshops within the company where our CEO has sat down with a small group of employees so they can have an informal discussion. And he's talked about failures, you know, in his, per, in his career. And I think it's important that people at the highest levels admit that not everything always goes, goes perfectly all the time. And it does take determination to work, to, to work in science. Uh, and and I think uh, I certainly push it within our storytelling to to also talk about these failures because uh, I, I think perhaps in the past there's been a tendency just to only want to talk about things once everything's absolutely fine or or even just to pretend that okay it, it, it was supposed to take five years but it actually took 15 but we'll not really talk about it and we've got a great example of a satellite a wind monitoring satellite called Aeolus and it was using uh, technology that had never been used in space before, a LIDAR, which is a, uh, you know, a laser radar. Uh, uh, and, and we actually didn't know how, you know, didn't know if it was going to be possible. And the first attempt we made when there was a test, the, it was so strong that it actually came back and burnt the optics. And it was a huge uh, disappointment at the time because it was almost like back to square, square one. Uh, and now it's been operating in orbit for three years and it's it's performing way better than anyone expected. This was just a demonstrator to test if it could even work. And it's now being used in weather forecasting today, which is like way better than anyone could hope. And I think it is so important to tell this kind of story. It is. I, I couldn't agree less. It is. It is. Um, Gina, I'm going to ask you one final question about the role models and um how do mentorship motivate these girls um into scientific fields because we know that there is a really great importance of of the of the role models in everyday life and not everyone can access such a role model not we we just don't have enough resources and we understand that but there is a really great important role that we could try to understand what the role of the mentorship does. And it's, it won't be necessarily a scientist. It could be a mother, a sister, a friend, a colleague. But could you just emphasize that point a bit? Mm. Yes, mentorship is indeed a, a deeply personal um, experience. So people experience it in different ways, uh, but the benefits of mentorship are in a sense, you know, universal. Everybody agrees on the importance of, of mentorship. Um, and it's also interestingly, a very much give and take relationship. So as, as a mentor, for example, on UNUSA Space for Women Network, 
I, I, I get out of my mentees just as much, I hope, as I'm giving them. So there's great synergy in every mentorship relationship. Um, with Penta, for example, we experienced this impact of mentorship. And I'll borrow some of the, the things I remember our Penta cohort have said of these young women um, who, who went through the Penta journey for five months. They said things like, after going through Penta, um, they learned not to be afraid of failure. Yeah. So again, bringing out failure as a, as a positive experience to learn from, uh, to ask for help when they need it. Um, and this is really crucial to engage in science. I mean, you really need that kind of mindset. Uh, they learned that perseverance is key. They learned about self-love. Um, again, to be a scientist, you need that kind of resilience uh, to find the strength to make uh, bold decisions. Yeah, um, the confidence to apply to positions they thought that were the, that they that they, the, they were completely out of their league. Yeah, so they said, "I thought this is completely not for me. I will never get there." And but no, they pushed themselves. They applied, and many times, sometimes they failed, but many times they said, to our utter surprise, we got these positions, whether it's an internship or a fellowship or whatever it is. Um, they also expressed uh, uh, an appreciation to this, to a sentiment of, of shared experiences, of solidarity. Uh, they often say, oh, we're not alone feeling like that. Oh, we're not alone being confused what we want to do. Oh, we're not alone loving so many different things and wanting to try so many different things. It's not abnormal. It's fine. It's great. It's actually healthy. And they appreciated this community as a safe space to learn and to grow and to share uh, together. Um, they also talked about the, realizing the importance and the value of, of reaching out to people, of networking, uh, both on the personal and a professional level. And I also noticed that many of these people are struggling who say, we, we realize the importance of reaching out, especially to senior people and being stopping of being afraid of, of uh, approaching senior people. Um, these people deal with some sort of imposter syndrome. And so um, this, this, really, this really has helped. Um, in, a, in, a, in a mentorship program like this, you really need to dig into the personal stories to identify how it has changed their life. Sometimes the changes are so minor, but they are so impactful. And what they're doing is they're building an arsenal, a, a treasure trove of, of mindsets of habits that they can carry forward uh, throughout their lives. That's great. Thank you so much for emphasizing that importance because it, it is, you don't have to necessarily become a scientist. We do want you to become one, especially after this pandemic, we did realize how science has a great influence on our everyday life. And we would love to have you as much as engaged in space sciences in particular, because this is our world and this is where we come from and this is our personal passion. Uh, we have learned several things that are keepers for the rest of our lives. Talk about your failures, ask for help, rely on the people next to you, your community. Airbus has shown us, even though for me, Airbus is like the hugest <laughs> there is. I just got such a, such a homey feeling <laughs> after talking to you. I feel like I'm just one of you now and I'm coming back home. And we do realize how World Space Week has engaged everybody around the world and the importance of having this celebration even though it was an annual celebration and it's an ongoing celebration, having those dates specified, celebrating science and space science in, in particular gave us a really great sense of achievement. And even though we're all around the world, space just brought us closer together. And basically I hope you took that we are as scientists uh, trying to bring Earth closer to space and bring space closer to Earth. It's not that far away. Just look up 100 kilometers, it's there. <laughs> it takes us more time to travel elsewhere. 
And I would love to thank our great, great panelists for, for joining us today and discussing science and celebrating women in science. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Thea. I would love to see you all in person again. <laughs> uh, but this gives us a chance to reach much larger audience and have a sense of better communication of science. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, you are all great. And I hope our audience enjoyed this panel. Thank you so much, Shia Shimrit. I'll add very quickly, because you mentioned the audience, as lovely as it is to be online and to reach people all over the world, um, and this is a big, huge advantage. Uh, the disadvantage is that we cannot see the audience. And I know you're plenty out there and you're all interested in science communication and public engagement. So I'd love to, to know more about you. In a, in a normal in-person event, we'd be catching up over coffee right now, but we cannot. So connect with, 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 with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you. I will connect with the panelists as well to see what you'll be, what you'll be up to. Um, and I'd love to hear from the audience and know more about you and what you do in that space as well. Thank you so much for the panelists and for you, Shimrit, and it's been lovely being with you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mogushka, for having us and putting this session together. And connect on social media. We just learned the power of that. Bye-bye. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you uh, to everyone who participated on this panel about uh, popularization in uh, science. Uh, thank you, Mary Wolmsley, Gina Halabi, Thea Dobnik, uh, Shingit Maman, and uh, Marushka Strach. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, now we are waiting for our next lecturer. And since we are waiting, we can uh, um, invite you to grab a cup of coffee before uh, we move forward uh, with the next lecture.